Baruch Hashem, once again, glad and wonderful and what a blessing to see everybody today in the house. Hope that you are having or have had a great Purim holiday and a joyful Purim holiday. Hope everybody enjoyed the Megillah reading we had the other night. Baruch Hashem. Paramount Pictures called, they want to sign us. We want to turn it into a full-length movie, Baruch Hashem. I want that. The search for the Holy Megillah is coming out soon. So uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun. And wait for next year. Ha ha. It's going to be even better. It's going to be amazing. So uh, man, what a, what, a, what a powerful time we have today to get into the Megillah of Ruth. So let's start out with our blessing and get right into our study today. Blessed are you, Adonai, God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of Torah. Please, Adonai, our God, sweeten the words of your Torah in our mouth and the mouth of your people, the house of Israel. May we and our offspring and our offspring's offspring and the offspring of your people, the house of Israel, all of us know your name and study your Torah for its own sake. Blessed are you, Adonai, who teaches Torah to his people, Israel. Amen. And we're going to have our blessing for the reading of the Megillah here. Megillah of Ruth. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher ki itshanu bimitzatah v'itzivanu, al mikra Megillah. Amen. So I'd like for you to open up to the book of Ruth. As we uh, we're going to go ahead and read, we read the last, or yes, last week we read the first, I should say, uh, nine verses, and today's reading is uh, verses 10 through 18, but I'm going to go ahead and start from the top. We're going to reset the stage, uh, no pun intended, and, and uh, look back at this story to kind of lead us into the, the theme of our discussion today, which is how Hashem... Two, twofold. How Hashem can bring the Mashiach out of um, a seemingly impure place and the, the correlations between King David and his life and how it relates to the Mashiach. Some, some of this I'm certain that none of you have, some of you have not heard before, Baruch Hashem. So let's read the Megillah. It says, And it happened in the days when the judges judged that their famine there was famine in the land, and a man went from Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn in the fields of Moab, he, his wife, and his two sons. The commentary to this, when it says it was a generation or a time, in fact, when the judges judged, it says that if a judge said to a man, take the splinter from between your teeth, he would retort, take the beam from between your eyes. Bava Basra 15b. It was a time in which the judges were not respectable because they were, they were hypocrites. They were not living the life that they told to live. Now, this is important from the standpoint of Mashiach because it's exactly what Mashiach was dealing with in his, in his time when he was here. This is why. See, there's no coincidence. This is why he said, this is why he taught, before you tell your neighbor to take the splinter from the eye, take the plank out of your own eye. Why was he teaching such a subject? Why? Because he was in a time in which this was going on. So we see the story of Ruth correlating with the gospel account. Amen. And so this is why he said, listen, the judges seat, sit in the seat of Moses. There is not a literal seat of Moses. That was a euphemism for a place of authority. I know I've read articles before that they found the seat of Moses. The search for the seat of Moses is going to be a, it's a next Indiana Jones movie. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a euphemism. He so said they sit in that seat of authority. So you have to listen to them, but don't do what they do. And this is what it means to judge the judges. And so because of the sin that was going on, God brought a famine and Elimelech, uh, Elimelech was considered a, a, 
um, a, a, a great man. He was, the, he was a, a descendant of Nakshon. He was a prince of Judah. He was supposed to stay in the land because he was very wealthy and help those who were hungry because of the famine. But instead, he shucked his duties and decided, because he was selfish, he decided to, to leave so he didn't have to give his money away. And where did he decide to go? He went to the, the worst place you could go. The Torah says, don't even have anything to do with the Moabites. And where did he go to hang out and live? The Moab. Moab. So verse 2 says, the name of the man was Elimelech, the name of his wife, wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Shilon, Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah, they came to the field of Moab, and there they remained. So it says here, also in the comments, Bethlehem was originally called Ephrath. So when it says he was an Ephrathite, it doesn't mean that he was from Ephraim. He was from Judah. Although, esoterically, there's a connection here from, with Ephraim and Judah being combined in this Bethlehem story. Isn't it interesting that in, just so happens in the town of Bethlehem that it's also called after a name that is similar to Ephraim? Why? Because the first redeemer is Messiah ben Yosef, who is from the tribe of what? Yosef came Ephraim and Manasseh. So there's a connection there. There happened to be another town called Bethlehem in the town of Zebulun. In the, in the area, rather, of Zebulun. There was another, there was another Bethlehem. And so when it talks about in the scripture that Zebulun has seen a great light, right? The territory of Zebulun. So anyway, it says Bethlehem was originally called Ephrath and later given the name Bethlehem. Also, there was a very distinguished family in the tribe of Judah called Ephratim, that's Ephra Ephrathites, because they descended from Ephrath, which happened to be another name of Miriam, the sister of Moses, from Tractate Soda 11a who they say is the wife, became the wife of Caleb. Caleb did good. So listen to this. I want you to put two and two together now. Now, is, there's no coincidence. Say that with me. There's no coincidence. So it just so happens in the town of Bethlehem that we are going to have on earth a woman give birth to the Mashiach who happens to be named Miriam, after which the town is named. Why? Because Isaiah says that out you will draw water with joy from the wells of Yeshua. So in Isaiah 12. And the well in the desert sprung up in the merit of Miriam. And now the town in which the Mashiach is going to be born happens to be named after Miriam. And Miriam is the mother's name of the woman who's going to give birth to the Mashiach. Now you tell me. Verse 3. <laughs> We're doing good. We're doing good. Somebody asked me, you're going you're gonna to take all of the book of Vayikra to go through Ruth? How are you going to do that? We're on verse 3. Yeah. <laughs> it's Parshah off. Right, right. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women. The name of the one was Artha, and the name of the second was Ruth, and they lived there about 10 years. So the Targum translates, they became officers there, which means that they stooped to such a so low level when, once they got the Moab that they just went ahead and completely assimilated. Wow. And they just became like Moabites. They married Moabite women. They didn't, even have, they didn't even have the women convert. They just married Moabite women. As it says here, the common expression used is vayisu, that is married, is, is used rather than the legal term vayikuk, took. So if you take a wife in scripture, it means that you've legally married her according to halacha. If you just are married to somebody, it means that you're married to someone, but halakhically it's a forbidden marriage. Why? Because the Torah says you're not allowed to marry a non-Jew. And so therefore, any children that come about as a result of that marriage are considered not Jewish. Period. Okay? So if you are a Jewish man married to a non-Jewish woman and you have children, the children are not Jewish. They would have to go through conversion along with the wife. If, however, you're a woman 
and you convert, every child that issues from your womb after that is Jewish, 100%. If you're pregnant and you convert, the baby's born a Jew. Because it went through the water. We actually, it preceded you. It's already in the water. Verso <laughs> cuatro. They married Moabite women. The name of the one was Orpha. The name of the second was Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. So just a side note. We have Orpha and Ruth. Orpha and Ruth both loved Naomi. Now this is an important message you need to hear. Both Orpha and Ruth loved Naomi. They loved Israel. They both loved Israel. They both kissed Naomi and hugged her, and they both wept. But there was a difference between the two. Orpha loved Israel. She hugged Israel. She wept on Israel's neck. She was supportive of Israel. She helped Israel. But when it came time to join Israel, which she had the choice to do, she turned and walked away. Ruth, on the other hand, did the exact same thing that, that Orpha did. The only difference is she cleaved to Naomi. She cleaved to Israel and says, I will not depart from you. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. Where you die, I will die, which means a Jewish cemetery. So this is the critical difference. So I ask you, who, using Scripture, who is the example? Is it Ruth or Orpha? Who is put up there as the example for people to look to and follow? Is it Ruth or Orpha? Now the backstory to Orpha, we'll get to this later. We'll repeat this again at an, uh, later on in the story. But what we find is that Ruth eventually gives birth to David. Orpha gives birth to Goliath and his brothers. We learn that. And who slays Goliath? I'm sorry, I, I was trying to remember who it was. I couldn't remember. <laughs> I've searched all night. David. So who's the example? If you love Israel and you support Israel, and you shed tears for Israel, but you refuse to join Israel. You give birth to Goliath. If you join Israel, you give birth to David. That's what the Scripture shows us. Moreover, it says the Torah contains 606 commandments in addition to the seven Noahide laws so together, 613. The, the commentators note that the number 606 is equal to the numerical value of Ruth, which means that Ruth is the convert par excellence. This was the number of additional mitzvot that she accepted upon herself. She wasn't satisfied with the bare minimum. Ruth wasn't satisfied. I can go back and I can just do the seven. Why should, I take se why should I take only seven gold coins when God has offered me 613 gold coins? Who would do that? You have a choice. You can take seven gold coins or 613. It's your choice. I think I'll just stick with seven. All that gold waits in my pockets. Right? It's rather seen. It's too hard to carry around all that gold. What woman says that? She wants the ring that when she puts it on, it does this. <laughs> she has to walk around and say, look at my ring. Isn't it beautiful? <laughs> so who's our example? Who is the example? Are we supposed to follow Orphas? Are we supposed to follow Ruth? Are we supposed to follow Ortha, Orpha's example? Because many people, the vast majority of the people that believe in the Mashiach, follow Orpha's example. I love Israel. I hug Israel. I pray over Israel. I cry over Israel. Join us. No, thank you. I'm going back to my father and my gods. Oh, 
Ruth and Orpha were both daughters of Eglon, the king of Moab. They were both princesses of Moab. God appeared to Eglon and uh, in Judges 3.19, Ehud came to Eglon to deliver God's message. And Ehud said, I have a message from God to you. And it says that Eglon rose from his throne in order to, to hear God. In God's presence, he stood up, Amida. And the Holy One blessed me, he said of him, you stood up for me. You left your throne of honor and stood up. And therefore, I will cause to emerge from you a descendant who will sit upon my throne. Wow. Let me just say that again. That because Eglon stood up to hear the God of Israel, the God of Israel says, I will cause to emerge from your descendant someone who will sit on my throne. Do you realize what that means? That means that the Mashiach sits on the throne of God. Now, God doesn't have a throne like we think. God's throne is the Ark of the Covenant, which means in order to sit on the Ark of the Covenant, you have to be that Shekinah glow between the wings. What human can do that? Just ask him. You've got to be the Shekinah. So God, it says here in the comment in the Midrash Zuta, it says that Hashem waited all those years, all those ten years, to give them the opportunity to repent. God's patience is long suffering, but it's not necessarily eternal. If we continue, this is just something we need to come to grips with because we under, we live in a theological world that says that we can just deny God, reject God, you know, show him the hand, and we can live our own life. And then whenever we decide to come to God, he'll be right there. Well, that's true to an extent. But even the apostles wrote about and said that there comes a point when, when God will give us over to our own desires. And we'll be living in darkness. And here's, the, here's the, the scary part. I've said this many times over the years. The scary part is we'll be living in darkness thinking we're living in light. And my friends, there are millions upon millions of people that are in that situation today. Living in utter darkness, thinking they're living in light. Now, someone said, well, how do you know? Rabbi, I'm so sick of people telling me that I've got the whole truth. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that I know everything. But I'm saying that what I believe is based on this, not something else. That's, and and this, is our own, this is our only anchor. The Tanakh is our only anchor. Anything that gets away from the anchor, obviously we're drifting. So it says in verse 5, the two of them, Malon and Chilon, also died, and the women were left of her two children and of her husband. She then arose along with her daughters-in-law and to return to the field of Moab. So she had heard in the fields of Moab that Hashem had remembered his people by giving them food. She left the place where she had been with her two daughters-in-law with her, and they set out on the road. So it says they set out, and they set out, literally they walked. The word uh, is related to the word halacha. It has the same uh, root. So it says here that as they walked, Naomi discussed with these two women, her two daughters-in-law, the laws of the proselyte as they walked along the way. Why? Because on one hand, she was discouraging them, and she actually discourages them three times. She was discouraging them as a test, but at the same time, she was talking them about the fact that if you come back with me, this means a life change. Because the fact of the matter is, you cannot live in Israel. You can't live in, in the covenant community as a Moabite. There's no Messianic Moabites. You can't live in the covenantal community unless you, you take upon yourself the covenantal responsibility. You can't get the benefits, my friends, without the responsibility. We live in a culture that wants that. 
We want all the benefits, but no responsibility. Everybody wants universal health care. We want universal jobs. Everybody wants to make the same amount of money. We all want to live in the million-dollar mansion, but we don't want to do what it takes to get there. Everybody wants, everybody wants a million dollars a year and work nine to five. Nobody that makes a million dollars a year works nine to five. They're there when you get there, and they're there long after you leave. And you say, well, no, they, they're, they're, they go here and they go there. Listen, let me just say something. When you own your own business and people in here own their own business know what I'm talking about, you never get off work. <laughs> and if you have a small business, oftentimes you're the janitor, you're the accountant, you're the marketing specialist, right? So they want, a lot of people want all the benefits of the covenant but not the responsibility of the covenant. God, I want your grace but not your commandments. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Why? Because it's just too inconvenient. Oh, I know you were beaten for me, and they pulled out your beard. They blindfolded you and hit you in the face. They prophesied to us who is hitting you, and they mocked you and spit at you, and you left your throne for me. But you know, I've got to pass Arby's, and I can't do that. It's just too hard. So the question becomes, if there's no desire to reach converts, why is there a halakha for converts? And if we don't really care about people bringing people into the covenant, then why would namely bring it up on the way to... Why would you just say, hey, just go back? There's no, there's no hope for you. According to Ashlish, once they reached the road to return to the land of Judah... Naomi realized, it says here, that they had, not, they had not escorted her as a mere courtesy, but their intention was actually to go back to Israel with them, to, to remain in Judah. Somebody sent me a message not too long ago and said, ask if our conversions were recognized in Israel. Of course, that's a whole political mess. Y'all know about it. I told you about it. And uh, my, my response to him was, why do you want to live in Israel? I love Israel. Great, I do too. Why do you want to live there? God has called me there. Fantastic. Why? Why is he calling you there? I just, and what I got around to this person was, is you realize going there, you, you don't, you, you got you to be there, like in covenant there with them. Like you, you, you can't just go there and be, you know, they want to go there, I guess, and just pray or whatever. But, you know, you got to go there and like, you know, work the land spiritually and physically. And if, you're, and if you want to go there and missionize, I'm, I'm not your huckleberry. <laughs> so we don't need Jews to become Baptists. No offense. Right, right. That's the last thing we need. Yeah. We need Baptists to become Jews, actually. Yeah. <coughs> Christian might ask me, how do I witness to a Jew? My answer to them is don't. Because what you're saying is not the truth. I'm just, I hate to say it. It's not the truth. Yeah. Yeshua did not come and do away the Torah. I'm sorry, that's a lie. He didn't come and make all foods clean. It's, that's not even in the Bible. So I'm just saying, don't do it. She told them not to follow each other blindly, but as individuals, to carefully consider the implications of conversion and act out of deep and, and act rather out of deep personal conviction. She says, "Lekna, go along with me," or. Shebuna, return to your mother's ha home, but whatever course you choose, she said to them, may God repay your goodness and may you find husbands. So, as Zakin Rayford is so fond of saying, when you come to a place like Sar Shalom, you have to understand, this is, not a, uh, this is not a fad. This is not a phase of your Christian walk, if you happen to come from Christianity. This is not a phase of your Christian walk. This is not the next thing you know, and, and then next, next year or the year after that will be something new. This is a lifestyle change. It's a commitment. It's why conversion, you know, theoretically conversion could happen within a few days. Somebody comes and wants to accept the God of Israel and, want to, and we take them to the, and get them circumcised and not already circumcised or whatever, get them mikvah. That, theoretically that could happen much sooner than, than the, the year that it takes now. So the question is, why does it take a year? The answer is because we need to make sure that you're not kidding. 
And you need to make sure that you're not kidding. Because this is a covenant lifestyle. That's what Messiah was calling us to because everybody says, I lay myself down for you, Lord. I lay myself down for you. He says, there's the altar today. I see the knife and the fire, but where's the lamb? Where's the lamb? And God will provide a lamb, my son. Me? You mean that I actually have to change my lifestyle? I cannot have beef and cheese enchiladas anymore? When I, I go to the store and I see thousands of pounds of beef, I can't eat it unless it's kosher certified. That's right. That's a burden, Lord. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to his mother's house. May Hashem deal kindly with you as you have dealt kindly with the dead and me. And may Hashem grant that you may find security each in the home of her husband. She kissed them, and they raised their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why should you come with me? Have I more sons in my womb who could become husbands to you? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. And even if I were to say there is hope for me, and even if I were to have a husband tonight and bear him a son, would you wait until they were all grown up? Would you tie yourself down for them not to marry anyone else? No, my daughters, I'm very embittered on account of you, for the hand of Hashem has gone forth against me. And they raised their voices and wept again. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, look, your sister-in-law has returned to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you, to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God is my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. Thus my, may Hashem do to me, and so may do more, if anything but death separates me from you. Now that passage is used all the time in weddings. What they don't realize is they're quoting from somebody who is converting to Judaism. We think it's romantic. Your God should be my God. Your people should be my people. Uh -huh. She's saying that to Naomi, the Jewess. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she stopped arguing with her. Like, like when Mashiach was talking to the, the woman, and she said, heal my daughter. And he said, should I give the children's bread to the dogs? And she said that even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. She was so determined that Yeshua said, okay. So we have a scenario here. There's a pattern that emerges where we see that Mashiach and the seeds or the sparks of Mashiach come from the least likely sources. And let's just kind of go through them for a second. Joseph, and this is important for you to realize, because, let me just set this up. People will say, how can you believe? I had this said to me by rabbis. How can you believe in this Messiah when all the rabbis for all time have rejected him as the Messiah? Which isn't true, of course, but the vast majority have, that's for sure. So why, how is that to be true? Of course, you have to understand, Rashi rejected him, Ramban, Ramban, Orhaim, um, Rabbeinu Bakya, they all rejected him, but, but what message were they receiving about him? What was, who were the people standing up and saying that this man who came from Bethlehem is the Mashiach? They were people that were literally living or, or, or serving in buildings that were full of idols. They were eating ham at Easter time, and they had rejected the entire Torah. Let me just tell you something, my friends. That message, I'm telling you, is the wrong message. And I believe in the Mashiach. I'd be standing there right there with Ramban going, that is a false message. So naturally they don't believe in him. Any, any rabbi that would listen to that message and believe it is somebody who is not following the Torah. You say, well, the, but, but don't you see the peace of God in my eyes? Come on. Hindus have peace. Wiccans have peace. People that worship the earth Eat, have peace. What does peace got to do with it? Got to do with it. <laughs> the 
Joseph re was rejected by all his brothers, including his father. He was told by his brothers, all of them in unity, including his father, he was told by all of them that his dreams were mere fantasy and they would never come to pass. And yet he ended up being the viceroy of Egypt and literally the savior of the world. So when somebody says, well, all the rabbis reject, they rejected Joseph. All of them. Moses, the redeemer who comes from the house of Pharaoh. The, think about that. Our redeemer was brought up in Pharaoh's house. Raised by the daughter of Pharaoh, who was a convert. I had a rabbi once tell me that a convert can't, can't sit as a judge on a Beit Deen, which actually is not true because in the Halakha it absolutely says he can. But I would like to say that isn't that interesting because a convert raised the Redeemer, Correct. but not allowed to sit on a Beit Deen. But you can raise the Redeemer. Think about it. Moses was betrayed by his people. You realize that he was betrayed by his people, which caused him to go into exile? Did you ever think about that? His people betrayed him, which is why he was sent out into Midian. He was rejected by his people. When he came back and sat on the Redeemer, he said, no, you're not. And he was sent into exile only to return as the chosen Harishon Mashiach, the first anointed one. Judah. Judah had a night with a prostitute, or I suppose what he thought was a prostitute. And because of that union that he entered in thinking that he was engaging with a, a harlot, because of that came the twins, and from that, those twins, Perez, who, from, who would come Mashiach. Rahab, who owned and operated a brothel, converted, married the son of Nakshon, whose name is Salma, and she became the mother of Boaz, who would marry Ruth. Elimelech, a failed leader, who left his people in a time of distress, and he fled to the detestable land of Moab, he did this because he was selfish and greedy. But because of him and doing that came the very spark of the Mashiach. And then we have Ruth, a Moabitess. We learn here that uh, from the daughter of incest, and not just that, but a princess of idolatry, came the seed of the Mashiach, the redeemer of the whole world. And... Uh, the king of Israel. It says here in the insights, I want to read some insights um, about this concept of the two Dalits in the name David. There's, it says, to begin with, that all Jews, regardless of what tribe you come from, are called Jews. And the reason, and it, it actually gives the example of Mordecai, the Jew from the book of Esther we just studied. And the reason is, is because we worship and thank God and we realize that everything we have, all of our life, prosperity, everything comes from God as an undeserved gift. That's why all Jews are Jews, period. But it goes on to say that the name Judah, of course, is the four-letter divine name with the Dalit put in it. That's Yehuda. So it says the word Dal in Hebrew means pauper. So Judah has within himself the majesty of the creator and his kingship is the kingship. It says right here, his kingship is the kingship of God in a mortal form. That's what it says right here. But Judah sees himself, even though he realizes that his kingship is literally a manifestation of God on the earth, he considers himself a pauper. pauper. That's not something to be proud of. No matter how exalted his position, it says, he understands it's an undeserved gift. 
So David, it says here, being the first of the Judean kings, modeled after all his successors, embodies the same concept of this name. His name begins with a Dalit and ends with a Dalit. The two messiahs are in his name. The two Mashiachs are in the name David. And it's in the middle is a Vav, which is man. So it says here, for all his grandeur and achievement, for all the love of his maker bore for him, the holiness that made even the blood of his war victims seem like holy offerings before the altar of God, David from beginning to end considered himself a pauper, an impoverished mortal who carried only the gifts of God but nothing of his own. In the future, the last Dalit, it says here, the Mashiach will be considered a pauper, as it says, a poor man riding on a donkey from the book of Zechariah. So the, the king who rules over kings, it says here, is going to be that poor man riding on a donkey. And all this because of Ruth. So the question becomes, can anything good come from Nazareth? If the pattern of redemption is the, all the people, if we had to sit down and say, where is the Mashiach going to come from? If the sages sat down before any of this happened and said, where is the Mashiach going to come from? Hey, let's face it. The, the, the guy that started it all, a Abraham, his dad owned an idol shop. He, didn't, he wasn't just an idol worshiper. He owned the shop that sold the idols. And from all of that hot mess comes the Mashiach. <laughs> and so can anything good come from Nazareth? That's a question that's actually in the Basoria. Are you kidding me? Can anything good come from Moab? Can anything good come from Jericho? Can anything good come from having a night, a one night with a harlot? Can anything good come from a Jewish girl being taken and made to have a relationship with a, a goy king? Can anything good come from that? Are you kidding me? The entire Bible is about really, really great things coming from really terrible situations. Why? Because God's purpose is to extract holy sparks this is what this, the apostles were talking about when they said things such as that he uses the lowly to confound the wise it's exactly what he's talking about it burns people up you know why there's a rejection of conver con conversions and, and, and messianic Judaism and Judaism because it just burns them up that somebody could take somebody who has no Jewish background and knows nothing about anything, and within a very short period of time, they become a practical Zodic. And yet, like Jonah, we're begging Jews in Israel that have a kosher restaurant on every corner. Rebbesin's got this cap that's just about worn out, and she <laughs> wears it all the time. And she's been on Amazon trying to find this thing. So she can order a new one. And she was frustrated the other day. She threw her tablet in the back of the van. No, she didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, honey, where'd you get it? I'm like, look, just drive there and get it. She's got it. She says, when you were getting your hat in Jerusalem, I was next door buying this cat. And I'm like, so we got to go to Jerusalem, <laughs> obviously, and get you a new cat. But I'm just saying, that kind of stuff is there, and yet we're begging Jews in Israel, in Israel, begging them to be observant. It was Manasha and I were downtown at the jail Monday, and I and, uh, was walking around this facility, and I, he was teaching a class, and I was walking around visiting with inmates, and I sat down to make a note on my chart. And this man was standing behind the bars just a few feet away, and he says, Shalom. I looked up, I said, Shalom. I looked down, he, I could hear he was saying something else in Hebrew. It wasn't, wasn't computing with me because I'm, I'm just in this environment where I'm not expecting that. And I looked up and I said, I said, Ata Medeveratirit? And he said, Ken. I said, Ata Yehudi? He said, Ken. And I stood up, I'm like, What are you doing here? He says, Are you from Yaffa? I said, No, I'm from Grapevine. <laughs> And uh, I said, what are you doing here? He says, a long story, and just walked away. Oh. 
So next time somebody is down on you because, how can you be a convert? You know, I've been in Judaism all my life. You can say, eh, remember Ruth. <laughs> Look. You reject the oral Torah, it's going to be a problem. This story is the number one argument for the oral Torah. Let me tell you why, because I know you want to know why. By the way, we know Mashiach followed the oral Torah because that story that, that um, who read? David, David read today? And they said, how come your disciples aren't fasting? They're talking about the rabbinic fasts. Yeshua did not say to them, what? We don't follow that oral Torah. That was a perfect opportunity for him to slam it. That was a great opportunity. I mean, that was if he if he meant to get rid of the oral Torah, that was a wuffle bat miss. <laughs> but what he said was that while they have the bridegroom with them, they will not fast. Now, when Sabbatai Zavi claimed to be the Mashiach, he sent out letters changing all the fast days to days of feasting and rejoicing because he claimed to be the Mashiach. When you say, I don't believe in the oral Torah, that's all just a bunch of rabbis, you know, that was nothing but Ezra, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Obadiah, Zechariah, Malachi, Zerubbabel, getting together and making a bunch of stuff up. In fact, I'm going to prove it by reading from the book of Obadiah, who was on the court making stuff up. That's interesting. But, okay. So, the Torah explicitly says that you are not allowed to allow a Moabite into the congregation, which, mean, which means they can convert, but they're not allowed to marry a Jew and therefore cannot have Jews, okay? So we have a problem, Houston, and we have our Lepidniks from Houston here. So, <laughs> The problem is, if the Torah says Moabite's not allowed, the mother of David, who eventually become the mother of the Mashiach, ultimately, is a Moabitess. So, the Torah, if we're, if, we're, if we're sola scriptura only and we reject all tradition and Jewish teaching, then we have to come to the conclusion, and there's no answer for this, if you're intellectually honest, if you reject oral tradition... The only answer you have is David is not king. He's not even a Jew, Hashve Shalom. Therefore, the Messiah cannot come from him. Therefore, Yeshua is not the Messiah. Therefore, your entire religious life is a lie. Now, I'm going to submit to you that's not accurate. But rather, David is a Jew. He is king from him, like God said. I'm going to go with God on this that from him the Messiah is going to come and Yeshua is the Messiah. But how do we come to that conclusion? Because if we're sola scriptura, if we're word of God only, you can't get there. So you have to go where? Talmud. Talmud. You have to go to the Talmud. You have to go to the Talmud. As it says here in the Talmud, An Ammonite convert and a Moabite convert are prohibited from marrying into the congregation. And their prohibition is perpetual. However, their women, the female Ammonite and the Moabite converts, are permitted immediately. So there was a determination made by the sages that a female Moabite can enter the congregation, but a male cannot. Why? Because the whole prohibition had to do with the fact that when Israel was traveling through the wilderness, the Moabites failed to come out and offer them bread and water. And it was determined that since it's the man's responsibility, because it'd be improper for women to go out there, it was the man's responsibility, then it wasn't on the women, it was on the men. So the sages determined that a woman could come into the congregation, but not a man. 
But if you don't believe in the Talmud, if you don't you think all the Talmud is a big bucket of nothingness, then you're stuck, you're left with just the Torah, which means that M Ruth cannot be Ruth. This presents a problem. And if you try to come to any conclusion outside of what the Torah strictly says, then you're in violation of your own principle, which means your whole house of cards falls down. That's how life works. Okay? Now, there was a leader of the community at that time. Now, we say, now this is going to be instructive. How much time I got? Okay, good. Because I want to get to the story of David's mother. There is a, you, you get around um, rabbis who don't believe in Yeshua, and they argue against the Messiah, and sometimes their arguments have merit, and we don't have answers. And the reason for that is because not everything is answerable. Now, see, the illusion is, is that you have to have an answer for every objection. And when we don't have an answer, we're like, man, I, I just got defeated in the argument. But see, what you don't realize is that very often in Judaism, there isn't an answer. For instance, how is it that the mixture of the red heifer with the water can make somebody clean, but the one who's administering it and makes it is made unclean? How is it that a chicken is kosher, but a rabbit is not? Why can't we have meat and dairy together? Those are all called chukim in, in Judaism, and the reality is there's no answer for that. So I asked the rabbi one time, I said, we take it by faith that the tefillin are the tefillin, but how do we know? Where is our definite proof that tefillin are, you know, that we wear today are exactly perfect, exactly the right ones? And he says, you don't. You just have to take it on faith. So you see, there's not an answer for everything. But the illusion is you should have an answer. Now, to that point, we know that David is a Jew. We know that he's the king of Israel. We know that Ruth was allowed in. But there was a great sage, a great halakhic scholar at the time named Doeg. And Doeg was adamant that, Moab, that Moabite was not allowed and that David was not a Jew, in fact, was, therefore couldn't be king. So it says here, Doeg the Edomite interjected and said to Saul, before you ask about him whether he's fit for kingship or not, Ask about him whether he's fit to marry into the congregation or not. Now, I want to give you a little backstory here really quickly because we read the story about little David, the little boy David came and the king, and the king put his armor on him and, and we see that as mockery and many times it's been taught that he didn't wear the armor uh, because it would have been awkward and wouldn't fit or whatever and it was a way of the king mocking him. That's actually not what the Talmud says. The Talmud says that the reason the king asked from, from where are you and the thing is, he already knew he, who he was. So the, the question is nonsensical because in the historical timeline, he already knew of David because he knew of his father, Yishai. Yishai was a very prominent man. So the, the, the story goes, though, in the Talmud that when he put the armor on David, even though David was a smaller stature than Saul because Saul was a very mighty and strong man, powerful man, when he put the David, uh, armor on David, it supernaturally fit David. And he said, how does my armor fit him? David didn't wear the armor because he wasn't trusting in horses or chariots. He was trusting in the name of his God. That's why I throw the armor down. I don't need your armor. I got God. He is my magan. So anyway, he says, before you ask whether he's fit to be king, you might want to ask if he's fit to marry, to, to be a Jew. What is the reason that he might be unfit to marry into the congregation? For he descends from Ruth the Moabite, and the Torah precludes Moabites from marrying into the congregation for generations. Avner said to Doeg, we learn in Abrasia, when the Torah prohibits an Ammonite from marrying into the congregation, it refers to a male Ammonite and not an Ammonite, it's not a female. And when the Torah prohibits a Moabite, it refers to a male and not a female. But Doeg countered, but accordingly will you say as well that the Torah prohibits a Mamzer, but not a Mamzeris? As it is written, a Mamzer which connotes the blemish of trans, uh, strangeness. And Doeg asked further, Will you say that the Torah prohibits a mitziri, a male Egyptian, but not a mitzirius? 
a female Egyptian? And Abner replied, it's different here in regard to the prohibition against the Ammonite and Moabite, for the reason for the verse prohibits is explicitly stated, because of the fact that they did not greet you with bread and water, and the road when they were leaving. It is customary for men to greet travelers when they eat bread and water, but it's not customary for women to greet travelers with bread and water. But Doeg persisted. They, were, they should nevertheless have greeted the Israelites with bread and water. The Ammonite men should have greeted the Israelite men, and the Ammonite women should have greeted the Israelite women. So the episode continues. Abner was silent and unable to respond. Abner was silent and unable to respond. What that means is, is that Doeg won the argument. Abner could not come up with a good reply to that. The lesson for us is that sometimes when we uh, are in these halakhic discussions about the Yeshua and we don't have an answer, it's okay. They didn't have an answer for Doeg either. Do you know how the matter got resolved ultimately? <laughs> this is kind of funny. It's part of the, part of the story. So Doeg fought back, and the, uh, being the halakhic great that he was, no one was able to refute his arguments against the fitness of David. Listen to me. This halakhic sage, this great man of Israel, was arguing that David was not a Jew, much less king, and nobody could refute him. Nobody had a, an argument that would overturn it. But... Do you understand that David was a Jew and he was king? The halakhic sage was wrong. Wrong. With a capital W and all bold. Wrong. So there was a man from Sar Shalom that was there. I know, he, I know he's from Sar Shalom because I like his attitude. His name was Amasa, the son of Yisra. And he rose up because they're at a standstill. Nobody can, nobody's won the argument. And so this Sar Shalomi stands up and says, whoever refuses to acknowledge that this law, that is that a Moabitess can enter, will be stabbed with my sword. <laughs> this I've learned from the court of Samuel of Ramah, a Moabite, but not a Moabitess. <laughs> just thought that was great. You know what? We're going to end this because I'm going to end you. All right, so we're just going <laughs> to... I thought that was cute. Now listen, I'm going to conclude this morning because I want to read this story. Because remember, the whole theme here is, is, is understanding the, what Ruth teaches us, the whole story of Ruth, the whole story of this whole episode, what it teaches us about the Messiah. Psalm 69. Save me, O God, from the water, for the waters threaten to engulf me. I am wearied by my calling out, and my throat is dry. I have lost hope and waiting. More numerous than the hairs on my head are those who hate me without reason. Hate me without reason. Must I then reply what I have not stolen? Re repay, rather, excuse me, what I have not stolen? Mighty are those who cut me down, who are my enemies without cause. O oh God, you know my folly, and my unintended wrongs are not hidden from you. It is for your sake that I have become a disgrace, that humiliation covers my face. I have become a stranger to my own brothers, an alien to my own mother's sons. Out of envy for your house, they ravaged me. The disgraces of those who, revi who, who revile you have fallen upon me. Those who sit by the gate talk about me, and they start talking about the sages, and they taunt me like a drunkard. Disgrace breaks my heart. I'm left deathly sick. I hope for solace, but there is none. And for someone to comfort me, but I find no one. They put gall in my meal and gave me vinegar to quench my thirst. Psalm 69. That's King David writing this. The story I'm about to read to you, I actually got this story originally from Chabad.org. So if you want to read the story and print it out, you can read it there. This is the story of Netzebeth, the mother of David. Why would, why would King David write a song, psalm like this? His brothers rejected him. You can say, well, it's about Yeshua. Yeah, but it's about him. 
This is his story. His brothers rejected him. They wanted to kill him. Even the sages talked, talked bad about him. That's what I just read it about, it about it. So this story is about King David, how he was an object of disgrace. It says, Through no apparent cause of his own, he is surrounded by enemies who wish to cut him down. Even his own brothers and strangers are strangers to him, and they ravage him and revile him. Amazingly, this it says, this is the voice of King David, the righteous and beloved servant of God. King David had many challenges in his lifetime, but what could make him feel so disgraced and so reviled? What caused King David to face such an intense, uh, intense circumstance to be shunned by his very own brothers and in his very own home? As it says, I've become a stranger to my brothers. By the Torah sages who sat in the judgment seats, as it says, they sit at the gate and talk about me. Even by the drunkards, the drunkards say, I am the taunt of drunkards. Even the drunkards make fun of me. What had King David done to arouse such contempt? And, what, why, and why was there no one at, his, at this time of life who provided him love and comfort and friendship? This psalm, it says here, in which King David passionately gives voice to the heavily, heaviest burden of his soul, refers to a period of 28 years from his early childhood until the time in which he was anointed king by Samuel. David was born, it says, to the illustrious home of Yeshai. Yeshai is considered, at the time he was the head of the Sanhedrin. He was one of the most distinguished leaders of his generation, according to the Talmud, Shabbos 45, or excuse me, 55b. He was only, Yeshai was one of four men that the sages say was so righteous and so holy, never sinned, that had it not been for the sin of Adam, they would have lived forever which means you can't be a man and not be a sinner because we're all affected by Adam no matter what. But Yeshai was on that level. But because he was on that level, he had a challenge he was facing. David was born to this prominent family, but he was considered a, a disgrace by his brothers. It says here, David was not permitted to eat with the rest of his family. He was assigned a separate table in the corner. He was given the task of being a shepherd because they hoped that if he was out there all by himself with the sheep, some beast would come along and kill him. Which is why David said, I fought the lion and I fought the bear. The whole purpose of the lion and the bear was sent to kill David, but God helped David to live. His family was hoping he would die. And when he didn't die, they were like, oh. There was only one individual that was on David's side, and that was his mother, Nitzavit. So it says, why was David so reviled? Well, Yeshai came to realize that his lineage may be in question. And so he realized, I'm from, I'm from Boaz and Ruth. And Ruth is a Moabitess. Maybe I, I'm not fit to be in, in the community. So he put aside Nitzavit, who was a Jewess. He said, I'm not allowed to be married with you. So he put her aside. And he took for a wife a Canaanite convert. And he decided that I should have another child with her, and at least that child will be of a proper heritage. And if I'm a Jew, it's okay. And if I'm not, it's still okay. Well, this, of course, crushed Nitzavit. And she went in, you know, off into obscurity, so to speak. This all goes back, by the way, to the fact that Boaz died on the night that he married Ruth, and people viewed that as must be something wrong with the marriage. But in fact, it was, that's what Boaz was called to do. Boaz, by the way, was in his 80s, and Ruth was very, very young, 20s or something. She was also extremely beautiful. She could have had any man she wanted. They say that Ruth was extremely beautiful. But she married Boaz because she had a higher mission. And so his passing away, he did so because his mission was to have the seed for the Mashiach. So anyway, the story goes on that 
he decided to have a child with his Canaanite slave, but the Canaanite slave had compassion for her mistress. And she went to her mistress, Nitzavid, and said, let us learn from our ancestors and replicate their actions. My, by the way, you know she said our ancestors? Because she was a convert. So once you convert, that becomes her ancestors too. She says, let us learn from our ancestors and replicate their actions. Remember how Leah and Ruth acted with Jacob? I mean, Leah and Ruth, what did I say? Leah and Rachel acted with Jacob. So she switched places that night with Nitzavit. And, and Yeshai did not know the difference. So Nitzavit gets pregnant. But he doesn't realize that he spent the night with her. So he thinks, because she's still his wife, she just put her, he just put her aside. She thinks that now he's had relation, she has had relations with another man. So this is the issue. She believes that the one who's going to give birth to the Mashiach has actually slept with another man and committed adultery. Now, see, you didn't get that. Y'all were asleep. She, the, the sons wanted to kill her. They wanted to stone her to death. But he had compassion on Nitzavit and said, no, don't stone her. Let her have the child, but the, the child will be a memzir. You know, like, I'm, okay, okay, let me spell out, because y'all are still looking at me like, and... Okay, Miriam was engaged to Joseph, and she got pregnant, and then Joseph thought that she hadn't had an affair, but then an angel had to tell him, don't divorce her, and so there's the connection. Beautiful. Work with me, okay? <laughs> so, it says that everybody hated her. Everybody thought that, that the child was... Uh, was not a righteous uh, conception. And so from the time of his birth onward, Nitzavit's son was treated by his brothers and an, as an abominable outcast. Not, noting the conduct of his brothers, the rest of the community assumed that this youth must be a treacherous sinner full of unspeakable guilt. Therefore, every time something came up missing in the, in the town of Bethlehem, they blamed David. Eventually, it says, the entire lineage of Yeshai was questioned, as well as the basis of the origin of the law of the Moabite convert. People claimed that all the positive qualities of Boaz became manifest in Yeshai, and all the negative traits of Ruth became manifest in David. Now, the story continues that Saul is rejected as king and Samuel is told by God to go to Bethlehem and he will show him the one who is to be anointed. Now, did you ever pick up on the story that here comes Samuel. Samuel was, he was a judge of Israel. This, he was a heavy hitter. He was, when he came to town, the scripture says in 1 Samuel 16, the whole town was stirred because they, they saw Samuel coming like, oh, this is either really good or really bad. And all the sages of the town, all the elders came and said, do you come in Shalom? <laughs> Just asking. <laughs> and he says, I come in Shalom. I come to offer up a sacrifice. And he invited all the elders of the community. And he says, tell Yeshai to come and bring all his sons. The prophet of God and the judge of Israel said, bring all your sons, and he came without David. You ever put two and two together? He didn't consider David his son. He showed up with his sons. And, of course, Samuel looked at him and said, no, 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 no. And he looked at Yeshai, and the, 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 the Hebrew is very explicit. He does not say, are these all your sons? Because... He knew prophetically there was something going on here. So he, instead of asking, are these your sons? Because Yeshai would said, yep, that's all I have. He said, are these all the boys? That's what the Hebrew says, lads. Are these all the lads? And he said, no, there's a small one left taking care of the sheep. Because he's not my son. But he is a lad. And he's technically in my house because my wife gave birth to him. So Samuel said, bring him. We're not going to sit down to eat until he gets here. 
When King David, or when David walked to the door, Samuel was sitting there and he saw him and he looked, obviously, was the one that God had, had chosen. And God said to Samuel, you sit while my anointed is standing before you. Rise up and anoint him, the king of Israel. I should have added that when, when Nitzavit saw that David was coming into the, from the field to bathe and prepare himself to visit with the, the prophet, she followed him to find out what was going on because it was very unusual for him to be called to the house for anything. It says that when Samuel held the horn of oil, the, horn, the oil bubbled forth and wanted to be put on David's head. And when it fell upon his head, it says it crystallized. It became like glistening pearls and precious stones. And yet the horn of oil remained full. It says here the 28-year-long vow of silence that Nitzvah had taken came to a close. And at last she had seen herself and her son vindicated. Facing her other children, Netzevet exclaimed to them, the stone that was rejected by the builders has become the capstone. And the sons replied, this is from God, and it was hidden from our eyes. He was the Esther that became the Yeshua. So when we look and say, everybody rejects Yeshua, and they consider as if his mother, God forbid, was promiscuous, our answer to that is yes, and that's exactly what they said about King David and his mother. And yet, the stone the builders rejected became the capstone. But what do we know? What do we know? Na 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 na